You know what sucks more than having to watch your defense get shredded once? Having to watch your defense get shredded twice by watching the game film back and seeing how bad it truly was. That's what we're going to be talking about on today's Locked On Utes. You are Locked On Utes, your daily podcast on the Utah Utes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, everyone, and thank you for making Locked On Utes your first listen every single day. We are available on all platforms, including YouTube and wherever you may get your podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Utes is brought to you by Prize Picks. You can use code Locked On College for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars at PrizePicks.com slash Locked On College, and you can that deposit will be matched up to one hundred dollars. Daily fantasy sports made easy. That's Prize Picks. My name is JT Wister, so former intern inside the University of Utah Athletic Department. And on today's show, we're breaking down what I saw on tape defensively from Utah as they went out against Oregon. And uh, this was the kind of performance where I felt like you just really need to dive into both sides of the ball. So we are going to be talking about the offensive side on tomorrow's show and today just focusing on the um the defense. So when I'm saying, why was Utah unable to slow down Bo Nix and even the Oregon offense in general? Well, I think the first thing that I would say, and it's what I said yesterday, this is a really good Oregon offense. This is one of the best offenses in college football. I think scoring wise, they're second or something like that. I believe, I mean, they're there. It's the best, it's the best offense we've watched this season. Like, yeah, the USC offense is Caleb Williams and he's incredible, but Look, at you get a quarterback of equal quality of play so far this year. As much as I'm high on Caleb Williams for the draft, like Bo Nix is playing exceptionally well. He's making really great throws. Uh, And then the ground game, obviously better. And uh, just even the play calling, I thought, in this game for Oregon was stronger than it was for for USC when they played Utah. So, yeah, for why was Utah unable to stop Bo Nix in this offense? Well, number one, they just they came with a great game plan. They're executing at a high level. Um, I look, I think, back to an early third down conversion or just an early pass play. They had one for like eight yards or whatever. This is just smart coaching by Oregon. Uh, recognize that Utah was in man-to-man. They motion, and this is, I shouldn't even say Oregon does, because this is just a play called, and then you see them come out in man-to-man, but this kind of motion lets you know. Um, Bo sends his receiver in motion. The corner comes with him. If you're passing it off, it's zone more times than not. And uh, if you are going with him, it's man. And it was man in this situation. It was JT Broughton flowing the other side. And uh, Bo recognized that, and he snapped it. And Broughton wasn't able to get like over and set in time, so he's still on the move a little. When the ball is snapped, so since he was on the move, he was our and the other and the receiver, you know, got was already on the move too. He was worried about getting beat deep. So you have Broughton moving back deep, all worried about getting beat deep. And then what does the Oregon receiver do? Runs a shorter route, so it's an easy first down there because you know he was already on the move, had the advantage. Broughton had to travel all the way across the field. Going to be a little bit behind because he's reacting to that. So that's where it just plays like that, where that's just smart coaching on Oregon's part and also great recognition. The great recognition is something I want to give a ton of Bo Nix credit for. Number of times in this game where Utah brought uh, different creative blitzes, or even they were just going to get home quickly. And on the blitzes, Bo Nix always knew where his hot route was. And he even made a a number of nice throws under duress. Like there would be a guy open in the middle of the field, but it was the kind of open where it's like, you got to be a pretty good quarterback to make that throw. And, uh, and, and Bo Nix is a pretty good quarterback. I don't think he made a number of throws in this game that only five to eight quarterbacks in college football right now, in my opinion, could make because I, I look at that and I'm like, that's not bad coverage. I'm not going to say it's outstanding. Like they're draped all over, but that's a tight window throw. And, and Bo Nix is able to make those a number of times throughout this contest. So I got to give a lot of credit to him. I thought he did a really good job. They also did a good job a couple times leaving in like seven man protections. Like, okay, what's the strength of this Utah defense, their defensive line and their pass rush. Well, let's leave more bodies in to give our talented receivers time to get open. Like a Troy Franklin who made a number of nice plays in this game against Zamaya Vaughn too. And, and yeah, I mean, Utah has to be better too. That's definitely part of it. Uh, missed tackles were rough. Utah had a really good, had a hard time getting really setting the edge. Like Jonah Ellis would if like when they would run a Jonah Ellis, Jonah Ellis would stop the offensive tackle. Like he would turn him, but Bucky Irving was just able to go around Ellis, who was trying to set the edge. And whether it was the safeties, uh, Sione Vaki and Cole Bishop did not play great in this one. Uh, corners didn't tackle well either. Uh, linebackers, 
they did a really good job a couple of times, some stuff uh, confusing Utah's linebackers. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, yeah, just a number of times where Bucky Irving's speed to the edge gave Utah problems and uh, and they weren't able to cut him off and beat him there. And sometimes I felt like it was the hesitation too of like, okay, where's the ball really coming from? Because on one of the key runs, you had the offensive line blocking to the right. So then you have the linebackers for Utah naturally shifting to their like their left, the offensive line's right, and then you have the two tight ends pulling back, and they're the ones that block for are blocking for Irving because Irving's running back to the opposite side of where the offensive line's flowing, and then you have the linebackers for Utah realizing that this is just good play calling. Like you are taught as a linebacker, you you watch the offensive line first. You know you watch pulling guards and stuff like that too. So that's why initially, boom, step where the offensive line's going, then. Utah's good linebackers, Reed and Demuni, saw the tight ends pulling. Then you flow, but sometimes it can just be it'd be too late. And that scenario was when you got a guy as quick as Bucky Irving and the and the tight ends did a good job blocking in that situation too. Um, but yeah, Utah has to be better in that scenario. Other things with the linebackers, there was just good cover, good coverage, uh, or just, excuse me, a good job by Oregon just manipulating Utah's coverage and doing things like Utah was in a zone on one third down. And I think it was the wide receiver was like wide open in the middle of the field because Utah was in zone. Karene Reed was hung. It looks like Reed, maybe Demuni was supposed to be over a little bit more. Based on what I've seen, I think I think it's Reed is supposed to be in the gap where the ball is thrown. But because there's a tight end like who runs right at him, he feels like he needs to stay there. Even though if he would have vacated and flown back over the Utah defensive back, who I don't remember who it was, but he, in zone, I think he would have been there to still cover it up. But Reed's hung up because the guy's right in front of his face. So that's where it was just a nice design by Oregon to have two guys locating in that gap. Like if the receiver's momentum would have continued to carry him, then he would have been right on top of Corinne Reed. But based on when Bo Nix threw the pass, that's where it was just great timing, great execution, um, great everything there. So yeah, just great throws versus the blitz. I loved, um, just as a football fan, I thought Oregon did a great job leaving in those extra guys to block at times too. Bo Nix's pocket presence was also impressive. A couple times you'd have Utah guys coming through, whether it was ability to make those clutch throws under duress or just moving out of the way, resetting his feet and finding someone open. And and yeah, I mean, the Utah defensive backs got beat. Zamaya Vaughn got beat a few times. JT Broughton, Teo Johnson did. Like The Utah defense didn't have a good game, right? They got ran on too. Uh, the double teams for Oregon, Jack, credit Jackson Powers Johnson, the former corner Canyon grad, and that Oregon offensive line. They did a good job generating movement up front. They would blow Tanu Vasa and Tafun off the ball at times. And then they'd be able to reach the second level. There were plays where it's just like, that's, that's how you draw it up is you block him, you block him. And then we'll get to the second level, take care of the linebackers. That's exactly what Oregon was able to do at times in this game. And that's just credit to them. They just executed better in Utah in that scenario. That that stuff's not even coaching. That's just on like the Utah defensive tackles, not able to hold those double teams, linebackers, not able to get around stuff. Um, would Lander Barton, if he would in maybe helped a little bit with that maybe, but I didn't think the Mooney played that bad. I mean, I thought that once again, like no one on the defense played really well, I should say, but I didn't feel like it was like, man, Demuni, come on. Like this is where Lander would do this and that. Like Lander's strength probably would have helped just his ability to get off blocks. He's a little better at that than Demuni, I feel like, but I, I felt like Demuni played played pretty well. Um, or just in terms of I should say, I felt like Demuni played as well as everyone else. I didn't feel like, oh man, Demuni. No, it's it was everyone. Uh credit those Oregon receivers that I mentioned. The running Bucky Irving was really fast, good decision, hit the holes, explosive. That was great. And Bonix too. The Oregon offense was efficient. It was elite, and they made a number of plays against a really good Utah defense at home who uh, they got out coached as well. Utah did. So really a dominating performance by the Ducks offensively. Got to give them a lot of credit for that. So we just talked about all the things that Utah, Oregon did well, and then U Utah did not do well inversely. So then the question becomes, is the Utah defense as good as we thought it was? That's what I'm going to be diving into in one moment. But first, I want to talk to you guys about one of the sponsors of today's episode in our friends at Athletic Brewing Co. It's time for your game changer of the week brought to you by athletic brewing company. Much like I'm going to go as much as I was just saying, the defense didn't play great. Um, I could go with Devon Bailey for this because he played well too, but I, I still want to shout out junior to I mentioned this on yesterday's episode, his fumble that he forced and recovered on the same one is a play that off the top of my head. I only remember the likes of Aaron Donald making like that was such an impressive play. That's one of the 10 best, maybe even five best plays. We're going to see a Utah Ute make this year. No one will talk about it because it was in a loss and it's a defense attack fumble all that. Yeah. Yada. I don't care. It was unbelievably impressive. That was just an insane play by Tafuna and, um, 
Yeah, even though he didn't play his best game, that was in particular an unreal moment. So I'm going to call him the game changer still because that play was game changing if the Utah offense had been able to score. But at, that's just like that game changing play by Tafuna is exactly like how Athletic Brewing Co. has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. They make non-alcoholic beers that actually taste really good. They brew over 50 style of craft non-alcoholic beers, including IPAs, Golden Sours, and more. And they're consistently releasing limited edition experimental styles to add to their variety. They're truly fit for all times. You can drink them anytime, anywhere, and make any activity more enjoyable like watching the big game watching your kids games tackling work working out etc there's no hangovers ever and you can find athletic in store online and at bars around the country first size customers can use code locked on to get 50 percent off your first order online that's code l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n all caps no spaces at checkout for 15 percent off at athleticbrewing.com near beer exclusions and conditions apply athletic brewing company fit for all times I also want to talk to you guys about one of the, another sponsor of our episode today in our friends at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts, for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. All righty, coming back into this one. Talk about the defense a little bit more. Um, is the Utah defense as good as we thought it was? Honestly, I know they just gave up 35 points at home. I still believe they are really good. I still believe they are one of the 10 best units in college football. Like, yes, they're not on the field with a, a Michigan right now, even a Penn State's defense, probably Ohio State being another one. Georgia's, of course, being up there. But honestly, I still think this might be the best defense in the pack. Like, I know Oregon's defense, like, they just balled out. But it's a lot different against Bryson Barnes. <laughs> even though Utah has played well offensively, right? Like it's just different against this Utah offense that we know what Bryson Barnes is. He's fine, but he's not even a, once again, we don't know. I don't know if Bryson Barnes is one of the 150 best quarterbacks in college football. Like, and that may sound like a criticism, but when you think about all the starters and you go through everything, it's not that unrealistic to really, when you remember how many schools there truly are. So anyways, I, I still believe this defense is really good. I think they just had a bad game. Happens to a lot of defenses throughout the season. And once again, I just think it was so much more good Oregon. By the time the season is over, barring any injuries or anything crazy, I believe Oregon will win the Pac-12 this year. I think they're going to win out. I think they'll meet Washington again in the championship game. And I expect them to beat Washington. I think they're the most complete team in the conference. They probably have the second best defense. I, like I said, still would give Utah one. I just think that's how good Oregon is. And they very well might have the best offense. I know Washington right now is statistically maybe better, and maybe not even anymore. I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, I mean, their struggles against Arizona State and Stanford, Oregon offense isn't like that, and I don't expect them to struggle all year because of how good they, they might. Oregon might have the best offensive line in the conference. They might have the best receiver in Troy Franklin. I mean, I know the Washington guys are, are nice too. So, they, like I'm saying, Franklin's in the conversation. And we know how good Bucky Irving is. He's probably the best back in the conference, I believe, right now. And I think Jaquin and Sione are great, but Bucky – just that, and that's where that natural ability as a runner, he's been doing this all his life. Jaquindon just made the switch last year. Sioni still a safety. We even had a mistake in this game, and then a couple of them too. Not his best game defensively either. Um, and then Bonix being the Heisman caliber quarterback he is, which I do expect Bo by the time the season wraps, the regular season conference, especially if he does get that conference championship, I think he'll be in attendance for the Heisman presentation. That's how good I think that Bonix is based on how he played and, uh, all the scouts that were in attendance had to be impressed with his ability to make those tight window throws and just navigate the pocket. I mean, he looked like an NFL QB to me. So that's where I'm, I'm very curious to see what Bonix's draft future holds. But that's a conversation for another pod and uh, not one with Utah in the title, obviously. Um, but yeah, this Utah even still really good. Think about what they've done throughout the season overall. <clears throat> like, yes, you didn't shut down one of the best offenses in college football. I, I don't feel like there's that much shame in that. Even only allowing them to 35. Um, and you know, Bo Nix had 248 passing yards. Um, this is an Oregon team that is seven and one on the season. Like if we're looking at what they've done throughout the season. Um, 35 is still, I, and I should have looked this up before I started recording. 35 is their second lowest point total of the season. The other one is at Washington. 
uh, 36 to 33. And that's one where if you think about it, their defense probably wasn't on the field as much because the Washington offense was able to main or excuse me, the, their defense was, wasn't on the field or whatever I'm trying to say. I don't even know now I got, I've got myself twisted up, but the Washington offense, you know, just better, more effective. Like it's not that much uh, shame to give up 36 points because that defense was on the field more. That is actually what I was trying to say. So I apologize for getting all turned around there. Um, but yeah, I mean, Utah holding them to 35 points is still one of the better marks we've seen. They threw up 38 against Texas tech, 81 against Portland state, obviously big sky school, shout out big sky, but you know what I mean? Uh, they screw up 42 against Colorado. Like this is in line with what they've done all season. And they're the defense also got, even though they played better later, I just feel like they got worn down even in the first half at times because of how much they had to be on the field because of some of the offense's struggles, which the Utah offense maintained a few drives, just couldn't finish in the end zone. But, you know, still just one of those things where when your offense isn't scoring, it can be a little deflating. It's on you. You're getting beat up, all those all those things. So, no, I, I do think this Utah defense is really good. Look what they did to Florida and how good Florida's been now. Uh, even Baylor on the road, that's not easy to do. Look what they did to UCLA. Even Cal only holding them to 14 points. So, Still believe this defense is good. I do not expect them to give up over 30 again at home. They they're going to do well against Arizona State defensively. They'll do well against Colorado defensively. I guess Colorado will have a chance just because of how good Shador is. But I, we're actually going to talk about Colorado in a second in a, the opponent observation segment about some things Deion Sanders said that I didn't love. Um, but yeah, this is one of those things where I still think this defense is really good. Jonah Ellis is still one of the best pass rushers in college football. I know he didn't get home, but that's more of a thing like, okay, they were aware of him, doubled or chipped him at times, and the offensive tackles won some reps against him too, as always. Bo uh, Jonah Ellis also forced pressure. Bonix does a good job getting the ball away or was just able to evade it one or one or two times too. So that's where just credit to Bonix. Uh, still really like this defensive line. Still think they stopped the run really well. This Utah, this Utah defense is just not one of the – five best teams in college football as we said and their defense isn't one of the five best either i still think it's a top 10 unit but oregon was just better than the uh, it was clear in almost every matchup that they were better in this game if they played it again maybe the defense has a little bit of a stronger performance they would especially in a rematch of scally and then would do some different things defensively wise that uh would definitely help out utah but yeah that's this is definitely one where i look at it and i'm like this is more good oregon than bad utah um, Cole Bishop, Sione Vaki, still one of the, if one of the, if not the best safety tandem, not just in the Pac-12, but maybe college football. I thought they just had an off game. The set corners are still good to me. No, they're not great, but yeah, I mean, I still think it's a good defense. They're gonna have a chance to redeem themselves too against Washington in a couple weeks. Like, let's see how good you are on the road again. Like, if you, for I'm talking this defense a top ten unit. If they're able to hold Washington under 35, I think that'd be really impressive because we know how the Huskies have been putting up points, even if they've struggled a little bit. They're going to get up for Utah. Everyone gets up for Utah now. Back to back Pac-12 champs, and I just have so much respect for Kyle Winningham and what he's done. That's where it, uh, every one of those games can become a challenge in some ways. But just too many talented playmakers. Even Cronin Reed and Leivani Demuni, they're still very good. I still think this defense is is as good as we think it is. Um, and like I say, if you want to argue slightly lower, cause it's maybe not a top five unit, I think that's fair, but they've done, they've just been so good at home. The, I still give so much credit to Utah for, uh, what they've done throughout the season. So I'm, I'm excited to see how the defense responds against Arizona state. I think it's going to be a good response too. That's going to do it for our Utah football talk portion of this, but I do want to talk about some opponent observations of, uh, some teams we got coming up and not Arizona state. That's obviously what we we'll are focusing on, uh, throughout the week. But I do, I want to talk about Colorado actually, and, uh, not even as much on the field, just talking about something Colorado did that I'm, uh, and Deion Sanders did that. I'm very glad that Utah doesn't do that's going to be coming up a little bit of a rant on, uh, on my part in a moment. But first, I want to talk to you guys about another one of the sponsors of today's episode of Locked On Utes in our great friends at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform in North America. They're the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more or less than two to six players stat projections and watch the winnings roll in they have quick withdrawals in their easy gameplay and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what makes prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app do you guys think looking ahead to this coming sunday do you think patrick Mahomes is going to have a bounce back game and throw two touchdown passes do you expect that odell beckham jr who 
was pretty frustrated with his role today. He's finally going to break out and have more than 50 yards or Josh Allen throw for two touchdowns too. Lots of things going on. We got quite the showdown in the NFL next week when you're talking about Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs taking on two and the Dolphins. Well, how, if you guys think some of the players in that matchup are going to go higher or lower than their projected stat totals listed on prize picks, that's where you can head over to prize picks and have an opportunity to win some money because you can go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college and use the code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Once again, you can go to prizepicks.com slash Locked on college and use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Also, want to talk to you guys about another sponsor of today's episode of Locked on Utes in our great friends at UCCU. Learn and earn the UCCU mobile banking app that pays your entire family to learn about money. Kids, they look to parents to become more financially literate, but parents, they don't always know the answers. Learn and earn breaks down financial topics into fun, bite-sized educational games like quizzes and trivia. Every time a family member completes a topic, they earn points that can occur and can be redeemed for gift cards to stores like Amazon, Apple, Sephora, Walmart, Nike, and more. There is age-appropriate content for every member of the family who can compete against each other and track their progress on leaderboards. Learn and earn is inside the UCCU mobile banking app, so you can play it anytime, anywhere. The more you play, the more you learn. The more you learn more you earn. Learn and earn part of UCCU's award-winning Be Money Smart Youth Banking Program, helping kids, teens, and parents having fun while becoming more financially literate together. UCCU, love where you bank. All right, close this one out. Opponent observations, um, not on anyone immediately on Utah's schedule. Um, just shout out Arizona. I will say that. Like, they look they look really impressive. Coach Fish has that group bought in. Uh, Fifita's going to be a guy going forward that Utah will have to deal with in the big 12 also, but impressed by them. We'll talk, like I said, we'll talk about Arizona this week and yeah, I know Washington struggled with Stanford again, like this as Washington continues to find ways to win, it's going to be so hard for Utah to go up there with the way their offense and the, even the defense looked last week and get a win against the Huskies who are a legit top 10 team in college football too. When Utah is a, and Washington very well, maybe one of the five best. I still think Utah is one of the 20 best, but when you're talking about a difference in over 10 spots in the rankings, that can be pretty substantial, especially when you talk about the top 10 teams. And that's where uh, this Utah team that finds ways to win. It's it's going to be hard for Utah not to finish the season with three losses at this point now. Um, and Utah obviously already bowl eligible and all of that. But yeah, I just, I, it's going to be very hard for them to beat Washington. But I'm sure by the time that game rolls around, I'll find a way to talk myself back into it. It's like I uh, talked my way into Utah finding a way to beat Oregon after literally on last week's post game show, I was over there talking about how. Um, you know, this Utah team just keeps finding a way they'll figure it out. But on last week's like post game show after the U USC game, I said like, you know, enjoy this one. Cause we don't know what's next and all of that. And then I totally threw that out the window. It's a, uh, it's funny how we become as fans get emotional. Then like, we can rule the, we can do anything. Bryson go like we got this. And then you get steamrolled and all those expectations that were soaring high come crashing down to earth. But the opponent observation, um, I actually want to talk about Colorado and not even about the game. It was about what Deion Sanders said about his offensive line. I really didn't like it. And he has been, man, he has been vocal about his offensive line all season. He has been talking about he ever since he was on like, was it first take or whatever show? He'd just been talking about like, I remember hearing like a Stephen A. Smith and some of those guys um, go like, oh, Coach Prime told us like, you know, he's just a couple players away in the trenches from his team being really good. Now I will preface what I'm saying by saying Deion Sanders is right. His offensive line is not good enough right now, but there's a lot of college coaches dealing with that exact same issue. Not great play by their offensive line. You know what they don't do? They don't go to the media and go, we need new guys. Like it's one thing to say, like we'll evaluate and see if we need to make changes, things like that. But make changes are different than saying this group isn't good enough for us to win. We're going to replace them. Those players were still guys you brought in to be, and I think some of the ones on the offensive line are transfers, like to be part of this program who believed in the vision, who transferred over. And I know they're not playing up to caliber right now, but I just, you just, I, I just don't think you do that in college football. I just, you see that time and time again. These are still kids we're talking about, right? I just don't like calling and and going like, yeah, they're not good enough for us to win. Like we need to get new players in there. They're not, like I said, just they're not good enough. That's what it's saying, and that just doesn't sit right to me. Utah has was not good enough against Oregon. You don't hear, you hear coach Witt talking about changes being made, but we know like th those could be like, okay, swap a guy out here. Like we'll evaluate and get better. It's so much different than no, these guys like just aren't good enough. Like we got to move on from them. that's basically what he's saying. He said, they're not good enough in the line scrimmage. And yes, it's once again, it's been an issue for them, but it's how you handle it. And I just did, just didn't sit right for me to him to completely throw his offensive line under the bus. I'm not the only one that feels this way. Um, just show me examples of other college coaches who do this, where they 
really pin the loss on one group, say they're not good enough. I feel like that's what Deion Sanders has done. I know he's a little emotional, I'm sure, because it is his son, Shador. Um, so that might factor into things. But even that, like, it's still an evaluation. And the offensive line's not good enough. Once again, I'll continue to say that. But I don't know. I just, that didn't sit right with me. I, I didn't like that. And uh, that's the nice thing how having a platform like this, I can rant about it. And I'm also, to tie it into the Utah aspect of this, I'm thankful that Coach Witt doesn't do that. The offensive line, once again, no one played good enough. Coach Witt didn't say, we need to get a new roster if we want to be a true Pac-12 contender or anything like that. Like that's, or didn't pick out like Bryson's not good enough. We need to, he's, he, once again, like he said, like not about Bryson, but in the past he said like, oh, if we need to make a change to a place, we might evaluate and do that. But it's different than saying he's not good enough. That's, that's what Dion flat out said. And you could tell even like, just look at the way he said it. Like he means it and he knows it. And it's one thing to know it. Like some coaches do, but it's nothing. Just, you don't say everything to the media. There's a reason we don't know everything as fans. So I just, yeah, this is one that's starting to run run long now because I'm ranting about this, but I just I did not like that Dion did that. I thought that wasn't right for those offensive linemen, even if they aren't playing great enough to par. It just you just don't do that in my opinion. So either way, that's what some guy who uh, with a podcast his opinion on uh, on Dion Sanders. I'm sure I'll really rattle Coach Prime with uh, with that one. So that's going to do it for today's edition of Locked On Utes. Tomorrow's show we're going to be breaking down what I saw from the Utah offense and why they struggled mightily against the Oregon defense. Also, of course, reacting to Coach Witt's comments. He'll have his press conference. I'm curious what he's going to say. And we'll also start looking ahead to the Arizona State game coming up this Saturday because even though it feels like Utah season's over and their chances at the Pac-12 championship game very much on the strongest life support i would say with uh all the help they need to get in still not officially done so still a lot to talk about with this utah football team we look forward to having you guys along for the ride and appreciate you once again for making lockdown youtube your first listen every single day and we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow